Hey everyone, welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thanks to each and every single one of you who come back every week to listen, to learn, and to grow. Now, I'm super excited for this week's episode. It's been one that I've been waiting for for a long, long time. These guys are not only super talented, but really, really good friends. And I really believe in the work that they're putting out into the world and the work that they're doing. Now, when I first discovered them, I was absolutely blown away. And to to see them grow and to see them have the impact that they're having and the impact that they're having on people's lives through the way they do it is just magnificent. So you know I'm talking about the one and only Yes Theory. They're one of the most inspiring creative entities of our generation. Driven by their motto, Seek Discomfort, this group of friends from Egypt, France, and Sweden travel the world conquering everyday fears with the help of their community always choosing love over fear, which I absolutely love. A few days after meeting in summer of 2015, they started a video series called Project 30, where they documented the process of doing 30 new things in 30 days. A few thousand subscribers later, they'd found their calling. Now best known for their YouTube channel, Yes Theory is based in Venice Beach, California. They continue to produce unique, adventurous, and inspiring content, consistently putting in over 20 million views per month and more, from tackling insecurities like asking strangers for favors to bungee jumping out of a helicopter with Will Smith into the Grand Canyon. Yes Theory is on a mission to inspire, empower, and unify a community of people committed to reaching their full potential by seeking discomfort. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thomas and Amar in spirit. Yeah. Guys, it's good to have you here, oh, man. So good Thank to be you. here, Jay. Thank yeah. you for having you us. You guys are so epic. Like literally, like the, the, the stuff you put out is just, I'm like, I wish I was part of the crew, you know? Like that's that's how I feel. Like You're welcome anytime. Yeah, man. Really? Yeah. You should take Jay on something. Uh, yeah. What's your, do you have a big fear that you've been trying to conquer? It's a, I would love to figure that out with you. Like that would be yeah. fun to figure out like what is my real fear? Because I feel like, Half the time, I don't think, when you, when you start breaking down a lot of fears, and, and I don't think this is true, but you can start thinking like, oh, I have no fears. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. I think we all have fears. I, I think I have fears mm -hmm. that I don't even know about. So one day we need to do a brainstorm yeah. on what my fear is, <laughs> yes. and then we need to go and, oh, go and figure totally. it out. Totally. And the biggest thing is just finding the fears that you feel like limit you, right? And sometimes it's, it's, it's the image or perception that you have of yourself. And so, you know, Matt recently tried to land a backflip and it wasn't about the backflip. It was about how not being able to do it made him feel yes. and just realizing, I mean, you can probably explain this better than I can, but. <laughs> yeah, well, the backflip didn't go so well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that, still I'd, I'd be it. scared of trying to backflip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so these are the scars from, uh, oh, from the backflip a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. No way. Yeah, but like Thomas said, the whole point is, is to achieve freedom ultimately. And a lot of people will dismiss fears that they have, thinking that it's either too dangerous or unnecessary. But in our opinion, whatever constructs that you've built for yourself and whatever fears that may seem small are the most important because those small fears that you overcome allow you to overcome the bigger fears. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. the goal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not, now that you've told me that they came from backflix, like, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think I can afford to do that. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> tough, but he, I think you're gonna end up. Like, yeah, I'm gonna. It's just a matter have of to. time. Mm -hmm. I think he tried he tried to do it in three days, and the yeah. people who he was doing it with were these professional parkour artists who were like, it took me two months to do this, yeah. and, and you know, so yeah. we were. He put a very like slim timeline on on it, and he also had a genuine fear of it. So I think. With time, yeah. you'll achieve it. Time. Parkour is something I've always wanted to be good at, man. It's it looks so cool. fun watching it. Yeah, it looks yeah. cool. But, it's <laughs> yeah. hard. but do you always, when you take on a challenge, do you do it until you can do it? Or is it just the trying that's important? Like you said, oh, he's going to get there. Yeah. But is it about getting there and getting the result? Or is it just about, hey, I tried, I, I got some bruises on my face and I gave it a go. Which, one, which one's important? Mm. A line I love is the beauty is in the attempt. Mm. And... John Wooden, the coach for uh, the UCLA basketball team, I think it was UCLA, was defined success as just doing your best, le leaving it all on the court. And for us, that's how we see it as well. There have been many episodes where we've completely failed hmm. and we had given it our all and it felt like we had won. And for us, that was the key. And that's kind of how we approach everything. We, we, we've gone after things that seemed impossible and went into it, you know, knowing that it likely wouldn't happen, but it was worth a shot. 
and then sometimes it actually happens. No, yeah. and that's the ultimate glory. Totally, and I, I think the uh, you learn the most in the process, and 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 the outcome is obviously always serves in that as well. I think, you know, had we challenged Will Smith, Will Smith to bungee jump out of a helicopter and not gotten a response, I don't think we would have been like, oh, that wasn't worth it. You know, it was still worth the shot, but the fact that it worked made us believe in the impossible. At that point, it was like, okay, now we can literally do anything. Um, and so I think uh, I think there's value in both, but not succeeding is is not always the most important. Yeah, You know, or succeeding is not always the most important outcome. Yeah. I love what you said that though. How fun is it when something happens in your life which you never ever imagined would be possible? Yeah. And then as soon as it's now possible, now you start actually believing in the impossible, right? Exactly. Like so for yeah. you guys, was that moment the the Will Smith bungee jump for you guys? Or was it before that when you started seeing all the audience come through? Like, what was that moment where you were just like, whoa? Like mm -hmm. we just we just did something that we never imagined was possible. Was it like that? And then you started to feel like, oh, now we need to think bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. I feel like the very first moment we had was we had a video where we signed um, Chelsea players to our soccer team. This was day 19 of knowing each other. So we, yeah, this was in, yeah, exactly. Beginning of Project 30. And we had this idea. We, we found out that the Chelsea FC soccer team were staying in this hotel. And we were like, it would be hilarious to like rip up a fake contract and then ask them, do you want to join our team? Because we had like a little soccer team. And we were like... It'd be amazing if they would just sign this. <laughs> and then we went after it and snuck into the hotel and got them to sign and then put it up. And it went on like Lad Bible and all these kind of like soccer pages, football pages. And uh, dude, I know what Lad Bible is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> and it, and it just like blew yeah. our minds. Like the video got like 100,000 views, but we thought we were like yeah. the biggest. Well, at, the time, <laughs> at the time, we were getting 500 views a video and it was mostly from friends and family. Yeah. And we were living in a one bedroom apartment in Montreal, completely broke making these videos every day and so when that we uploaded that video the night and then we went to bed and every morning i would wake up and just check the views because i'm i i like views <laughs> <laughs> i like views i like views a lot <laughs> and gonna make a meme out of that yeah. <laughs> i went to and i went to the to the video and it had a thousand views and we never had a thousand views ever so immediately i'm like this is crazy and i click refresh and it went to three thousand views and all of a sudden i'm in my boxers and i get up and I shake the boys awake and I'm like, boys, it's going viral. <laughs> it just went crazy. Yeah. And it was just a, such a wild experience seeing this thing just gain life yeah. without you even touching it at that point, you know? Yeah. Like virality was such, we had never experienced it. To, so to see your creation being mm -hmm. experienced by so many people mm -hmm. was such a, it was such a fulfilling experience. Like, yeah. And then you, we just kept, it gave us so much motivation and yeah. it truly made us believe that like we could really bring our content to the world. Yeah. Do you remember the players that you signed? John Terry and Nemanja Nemanja Mati. Yeah, yeah, I know. As in, I know. As in, I love. I'm a huge soccer fan. So, like, what, oh, are you a awesome. Chelsea? I'm a Manchester United fan, nice. but uh, nice. but I know exactly. Oh, I need to watch that video. I don't think I've seen it. It's pretty it. funny. It's like yeah, I need to watch that one. It was one of the first ones we made, and and it kind of made us. It was the first time a video worked beyond our family and friends. And there's just something you learn when that happens. I'm sure you experienced it too. The first time a video just stands out, you're like, whoa, wait, there's people I've never heard of before commenting on this. It's such a weird mm -hmm. experience to have. Um, and I think that really, there's been like moments like that throughout time in the past five years we've been doing this that just expanded like what we thought was possible, right? Like that was like the very first one. The very first one was just starting and making the first video and clicking upload and then seeing that. It's like, oh wow, we have a video that's up on the internet. Wow. And then second and then third and then 17th day we do this and that happens. And then I think just- Was it 17th or 19th? 19th, maybe, probably 19th. <laughs> but, <laughs> but basically like the, the, it's the, the powerful thing with that experience is you just challenge, um, your what you expect from yourself and then you can start you know pushing that and, and becoming a better filmmaker and becoming more creative yeah. um and uh, yeah it's been an amazing journey just just learning yeah. and, and you learn as much from the failures as the successes but there's just something that happens when it, it does work um that makes you just want to push yourself even more and then yeah. and, and and get excited by the challenge of, of filmmaking and, and creation and understanding how the internet functions and also creating a piece that people really connect with is exciting because then you're like oh we really hit people with this yeah. one like 
people were excited to watch this. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. I remember when I when I felt that when you guys fooled the world. And I was seeing it everywhere. And then when I <laughs> yeah. saw you guys did it, it was the uh, Justin Bieber yeah, yeah, yeah. burrito thing. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I was so <laughs> impressed. Because I think I already was in touch with you guys then. Yeah. I think we were already communicating. Yeah, we were. Mm. And then I remember seeing it and I was just like, oh, no way. Like, <laughs> no way did they do that. Mm. So now you guys are genius. Like, it's, it's not easy. Anyone who's, the way you guys do, the way you guys think about your ideas, the way you make videos, the way you build it up, mm. the way, go, I mean, it's its genius, man. It's really strong. Thank you. I want to hear about both of your personal journeys of personal growth before Project 30 and Yes Theory. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to know what was it in your own life that brought you to make this content? Because let's, let's you know, this could have very easily just been fun content, prank content. It could just be like that, but it's yeah. not. It's about seeking discomfort. There's a message. Like you all believe that there's a rule behind your work that it has to be yeah. centered around meaning and it has to have impact, right? It's not just, oh, let's just make some fun videos that get views. So tell mm -hmm. me about your lives independently mm -hmm. before Project 30 that, that already had that kind of mm. mindset. Yeah. Either of you. Yeah, yeah well, I... I, I was never really into entrepreneurship or filmmaking or any of that as a kid. I was more just into adventure with friends. And the one memory that I remember was every summer I would go to France where I was half, I'm half French, half American. So in the summer I would go to France and my friends would stay back in the States. And while I was in France, I would come up with a list of like 20 fun ideas that my friends and I could do when we get back, <laughs> whether it was like going bungee jumping or going on this road trip three hours away. And I would write the list and I would remember sending it to my friends and them kind of not wanting to do it and just kind of <laughs> wanting to hang out in our town. And I remember how frustrating that felt to want to go to all these places and do all these things and not have people really align with it. Mm. And so I ended up in high school and my first year of college. Uh, and I love these people, but it, it was mostly people who wanted to kind of stay in one place and party a lot and have a good time. And I kind of got stuck in that environment, the party, like the constantly partying. And then when I was 19, after my first year in college, I went uh, on a trip with my family to Russia. And while we were in Russia, I read, read uh, Richard Branson's autobiography, uh, Losing My Virginity. And I remember reading it. And when he was 17, Richard Branson started his first ever company. It was a student magazine. And he built it up over three years to be the biggest magazine for teenagers in all of the UK. And he, the way he described it, working with his friends in the basement, grinding every day on phone calls, like trying to convince advertisers to pay money. And how eventually after a year, he got his first advertiser and then it grew and grew and grew. And the excitement of that was so much more thrilling than what I was doing. And I became obsessed, like I needed to start a company somehow. Mm. And so when I got home after the summer, when I got back to college, I kind of just quit partying. I just didn't want to go out anymore. And I just bought every entrepreneurial book that I could and just dissected everything that these guys and women were doing. And over the next three years in college, I tried to start several businesses with different partners. And the first few didn't really work out. But then the last one that I did was a clothing company where we would partner up with street artists from around the world and we would give back to the homeless in their cities. And that project ended up being my biggest one at the time and it got the attention of my university. We had a lot of students who were ambassadors and Thomas was a student at the university and his class did a marketing uh, consulting thing on my company and it was him and three other students who consulted for me for uh, a semester. And I met him the first day that I met him, he, they had this like pitch ready for my clothing company. But the one thing that actually stuck out was a story that he told me about sneaking into a big concert like that he loved of this artist that he loved. And his storytelling instantly captured me. And he had a small YouTube channel at the time. And I instantly went after the meeting to check out the YouTube channel. And I was just so enthralled because he was actually the first person that I'd met that had that same obsession with creating something and sacrificing everything else for it. I'd never met anyone that was willing to grind 24 seven to make something happen. And so we connected pretty much instantly. Mm -hmm. And after he told me all of his story, it was just like, yeah, let's do something together. And I'll let you uh, explain your story. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, That's that amazing, really, man. Thanks for sharing thank that. It's, I, I hope, 
I hope everyone who's listening and watching can just hear themselves in that experience mm. because I think mm. everything you just said, there's there's so much of it that we can all relate to, whether you're just lost in the partying world or whether you feel you're wasting time or whether you feel like maybe your current friends don't want the adventure life that you want or, right. you know, all of those mm. thoughts, but showing that when you're seeking it, yeah. you, you find it, you know, yeah. you find and connect with the people. So yeah, let's, let's hear yours. Totally. No, that's super interesting. We, I didn't even know about that story of your, really? of your friends. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> We're way, like way to whip it podcast, out. You find out. Yeah, that's <laughs> really great. <laughs> um, for me, it was a uh, it was kind of interesting. I grew up in in a family where my dad and all my uncles were all entrepreneurs. So um, my grandfather had moved from Sweden to France uh, to, for a job at Tetra Pak, and when he was fifty, he got fired. And uh, my dad and all his older brothers basically saw their dad go from being like this super like popular and successful guy to being somebody who just didn't have a job anymore for several years. And it just planted this seed in all of them that they never wanted to work for somebody else. Wow. And so I grew up in a very like, that was like the narrative, you know, in my family, just like work for yourself, like create something on your own. And I never knew really what I wanted to do. Like growing up as a teenager in France, I was like, okay, well, you know, figure that out eventually, I guess. Um, and I kind of ended up pursuing the path of traditional entrepreneurship going into tech um, was like the big thing in 2000, you know, early 2011, 2012, yeah. when I was kind of getting, starting college. And so did that for a while. And in one of my entrepreneurship classes, one of my teacher um, started his class with, uh, is it worth it to go to the Louvre in Paris, the museum? Yeah. And I was so confused. I'm like, I thought we were in entrepreneurship class. Why are we talking about this museum? And his eventual point was that when you go to a museum far away and you go, you put yourself in an environment that's so different from anything you've experienced before, um, you kind of transcend your previous perception of, of reality in, in some, to some extent, right? Like it's not just about going to see the Mona Lisa, it's about the smell, it's about the people that you run into, it's about the restaurant or the cafe you were at right before. It's about taking a plane and stepping off and being somewhere completely different. All of these emotions and, and, and experiences kind of expand your brain and you make new connections, right? And maybe, you know, you think you were, go you thought you were going to see the Mona Lisa, but it's actually the thing right behind it that you were you know, blown away by. Uh, and that's the beauty of doing something where you get out of your comfort zone. And it can actually be an amazing tool for creativity, for fulfillment, for adventure. It just felt like an like an unlimited amount of, of positive things can happen with that. And I was kind of sitting in that class and it just really struck with me. I feel like everybody walked out of that class and just moved on. And I was like, I have to talk to the teacher more. This is This just blew my mind. Like I had never really realized that you can consciously seek to get out of your comfort zone to gain value. Um, and so it just kind of like planted a seed in my mind. And like eight months later, I was making these videos and initially it was like comedy skits, which were like fine and fun to make <laughs> about like my, my experience in college. Um, but I just wanted more purpose. And I wanted something that could also give me purpose in the journey, not just like, okay, these skits are great, but I want something where like more grounded in reality. And so uh, that was around the time I met Matt and he showed me this show um, on MTV called The Buried Life, uh, which was about these four guys crossing off a hundred things they've, uh, off their bucket list and helping somebody else do the same. And immediately it just connected. I, like we were blown away uh, and I was just felt so inspired by, by this concept. And they had actually stopped making um, episodes anymore. And it just felt like such a shame. I was like, this is the best show I've ever seen in my life. Um, and so around that time kind of ended up simmering, Matt and I were brainstorming a lot of ideas on like, what could we do? And then the idea of doing 30 things that we had never done before in 30 days and making a video about it every single day came up. And then that was kind of like the, the birth of Yes Theory. You originally wanted to be what? hundred? Uh, yeah. I was like, I can do it every day for a year. And like, and, and I woke up in the middle of the night and I told my roommate, um, and he was like, you can't do a video every day for a year. Like that's ludicrous. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was like, you should do something smaller, like a week or something. And a week just didn't feel like, yeah. what, am I, what am I gonna get out of a week? But a month felt like the perfect timeline for that. Yeah. And uh, luckily we met Amar uh, in that exact period as well. He had snuck into my best friend's going away party. Yes. <laughs> and I just told him about this. I'm like, I don't know, I'm not like, I'm just, the summer I'm just gonna do this thing. I'm like working on the side to make money right now and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And then a few days later he met Matt and it was just like love at first sight basically. <laughs> <laughs> One saying we've all heard so many times has to be, 
Two steps forward, one step back. To me, I see it as you're still making progress, but there are obstacles that are slowing you down. I believe this applies so much to our health. Many people are sure to only eat organic, high quality, high nutritious foods. But when you ask them if their home cleaning products are safe, most would say, I don't know, or I think so. Again, you don't know what you don't know, and that's why I love sharing what Grove Collaborative is committed to. Many of the all-purpose cleaners you used growing up are full of harmful chemicals that have been linked to everything from respiratory problems to cancer. You don't need toxins to have a clean home, and that's where Grove Collaborative comes in. They understand that living healthy is more than just eating right. It's about ridding potentially harmful chemicals wherever you can, from the soaps and the detergents you use to their cloth you use to wash your face. Grove Collaborative is an online marketplace that delivers all natural home, beauty, and personal care products directly to your door. Every product they sell is guaranteed to be healthy, effective, eco-friendly, and affordable. Take the guesswork out of what products you should have in your home and go visit their site. Me and my wife love receiving products from them and notice that our home is just as clean, if not better. You won't regret it and it may actually save your health and your families too. Let's stop taking two steps forward and one step back when it comes to our health. We now know what to and who to go for. Join over 2 million households who have trusted Grove Collaborative to make their homes happier and healthier. For a limited time, when my listeners go to grove.co, C-O, forward slash J, you will get a free five-piece cleaning set from Mrs. Myers and Grove in crisp scents like mint or rose, a $30 value. Go to grove.co forward slash J to get this exclusive spring cleaning offer, grove.co forward slash J. Now, this is something many men usually deal with alone behind closed doors and can never speak about in public. Can you guess what it is? I can't hear your guesses, but I'm sure none of you said skincare. Most guys just feel like splashing cold water on their faces in the morning and before bed is just enough. We tend to believe having a skincare practice is potentially only for someone else. Now, I'm not most guys, and I'm grateful to have great skin, but now I see and understand the value of protecting your skin. If you want to look as good as possible for as long as possible, you need to address your skincare routine now. With anything, prevention is much better than finding a cure. If you want to prevent having bad skin that's damaged, Lumen is here to help. Lumen's mission is simple, to help give men the amazing skin they deserve through high-quality, expert-created products delivered right to your door. All of their products are formulated specifically for men's skin and made to target skin issues with maximum efficacy using top-notch ingredients like charcoal, green tea extract, and vitamin C. I love that you can choose from different skin concerns and they come up with the best management system just for you. Some of you know I've been trying their Ultra Hydrating Moisturizing Balm for some time now, and I have to say there isn't a day that goes by that I don't look forward to using it. It's just changed the vibrancy of my skin and also its health. It's something that my wife notices that I know it works. Recently started using their anti-fatigue eye patch. I love them because if I ever look too tired from looking at my phone or laptop all day because of meetings, I can simply take a few minutes to apply them and instantly I appear much more fresh and it really comes across. You deserve to look and feel your best and here's where you start. Go to luminskin.com forward slash purpose to get a one month free trial of everything you need to start your skincare journey at home. That's luminskin.com forward slash purpose to get your first month free. luminskin.com forward slash purpose. I love it, man. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's good to, good to hear those stories because I think, yeah, I just love the fact that you guys found each other because mm -hmm. that seems like such a big thing that you all share this fascination with mm. trying out new things, new experiences. Yeah. And you have this message, which is, you know, if you want something, ask for it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like if you, don't, if you don't ask for something, you don't know. Like, yeah. tell me about how you became so convinced about that message or where mm. that originated from. Because I think that, I think we're living in a world where people forget trying things that you guys try. We're just scared of asking for things on an everyday basis, yeah. even if it's simple things, right? Even if it's like really normal everyday things, we struggle. Tell us where that came from. Mm -hmm. Great question. I'd actually love to know what you think. Why do you think people are afraid of asking? I think people want? are afraid of asking because they think it shows their flaws or it shows their mm. weaknesses. Mm. <laughs> because if you ask someone for something, it makes it look like you're weak and you're in need mm. and you now have flaws that 
if they say no, then you now think they're going to think that you're not worth anything or that you've lost value. Mm. We, we generally, I'm just thinking of examples like mm. people get scared to ask for what they deserve in a relationship yeah. because they don't want to make the other person feel like they have the power to give or not give them something. Mm -hmm. Or people feel afraid to, to ask for, uh, they're having an issue with their building or someone in their life and they feel scared to ask for what, they, what they're right. worth mm. because they're scared again. I think it's, we're scared of giving away power. Yeah. We mm. think somehow that when we're asking, we're giving the other person the power mm. because they're getting the power to say yes or no. It's almost like we've given them the power already. Yeah. We've handed over our power to other people. And these people get to decide who we are and what we do. Mm. And maybe it comes from childhood and from parents just being very stern. I don't know. But there's a... It's almost like having a taste of... Like the first time you do it, it's, it's so nerve wracking, whether it's discomfort or asking for something that makes you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you gradually opens up this kind of freeing environment within yourself where you're like, oh, that didn't turn out so bad. Like I asked that person for help and they were so willing to help me. And then I asked that person, you know, to, to share my post and they did it right away. And then all of a sudden, not only do you ask for help when you need it, but you're so much more empathetic and you're so much more willing to help other people. And then it becomes this cycle of you helping others and others helping you. And that's how, I mean, growth in general happens. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise you're just stuck alone and nobody, you're helping nobody and you're not being helped and you just kind of stall. Yeah. It also creates, it, it attracts the people, the right, it's a great filter too, right? Because like somebody who's going to help you is open-minded and empathetic and, and kind most likely. Mm -hmm. But it also like, you know, if I had, if I was never sharing what I wanted to do, you and I would never have connected. And if you were never sharing what you wanted to do, you know, we never would have found that middle ground. And same with Amar. And I think that the beautiful thing is we weren't afraid to like ask each other for like help in different areas. Um, it's kind of like, um, I think one of, one of our friends, uh, Ben Nempton, who actually is on the show Buried Life, um, uh, says that you're drastically more likely to actually make something happen if you write it down. Mm. Um, and you're even even more likely to, to make it happen if you have a, like an accountability buddy. So somebody who holds you accountable or who can potentially help you because now you're making it real, right? Like so many people in the back of their minds think like, oh, I'll run a marathon one day maybe, you know? But if you start to take the steps towards it and tell people you're going to do it, immediately now it's real. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy to get stalled and never have anything happen. Yeah. But I really like the way you mentioned mm -hmm. it too about in relationships asking for what we want. It's so important. Yeah, yeah. And I think we struggle to ask for stuff because we also haven't invested enough to ask mm. in the sense of like, mm. even when you guys are doing a trick on the Chelsea football players, you've still invested in making a contract. Like you've got into that place. Whereas if you just walked in mm. and walked up to them and said, hey, do you want to sign for my club? And there was no contract. You hadn't planned it out. Right. They, they probably wouldn't have agreed or there would have been no video. It would have been just some silly prank video, but it's when you've created a scenario and similarly in our lives, like if you've invested in a relationship with someone or you've, you've put some time and energy into it, you then feel that you're able to ask. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's why we struggle to ask because we've just, we've not really brought anything to the table. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's cool. I, I like looking at it for you guys because you guys are doing this on a daily basis. Like the amount of, ta amount of times you've heard the word no, like you're called yes theory, but you probably heard more no's than yeah. anyone yeah. in the world, I'm guessing at this mm -hmm. stage. Because <laughs> yeah. what, what was like the biggest no? Like when you tried a new video idea or you tried a concept and it was just like, nope, like this, you know, it's not going that way. <laughs> probably Elon. <laughs> Funny enough. Yeah, we're actually trying to um, pull off like a, something we, we're calling Elon Elon week. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to try our best for an entire week to try and get Elon's attention to ask him a question. I love it. Um, and we've yeah. tried in the past and he's a very, very difficult man to reach. Yeah. Um, 
So that's probably been one of the biggest. It's not even a no. It's a an, it's a non answer. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone can do it, you guys can do it. I think we're yeah, gonna pull yeah, it off. I think we're gonna pull yeah, it off. I think you will pull it off. Yeah, yeah. I could see it. Elon Week sounds cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to help out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's that's cool. But yeah. there's actually one that I was thinking that was so funny because we walked out and we just didn't have the right energy. We had this idea of trying to convince a stranger to come uh, um, shark diving with us. Uh, do you remember that day when we went out? And it was just such a brutal day of like, we walked out and we were already a little tired and not in the best headspace. Cause you gotta like, and I'm sure you, you can relate to this, but like you, you will pull in the energy that you project. Yeah. And so if you walk out and you're in a, in a bad mood and you're kind of awkward when you're asking, the reactions you're gonna get back are gonna be terrible. And we were just, people were like, like roasting us for asking them. And he was just bringing us down and down and down. And we just eventually just after 30 minutes of trying, which usually we try for like hours, after 30 minutes, we just like, let's just drive home. Yeah. Let's just not, <laughs> let's just not even keep going. Like we're, yeah. there's no way we're convincing somebody today. And sometimes you just have to, you just have to accept that that's what it is, right? Like yeah. not every single time will work. But we learned something that day, right? That we carried over and the next time we were better. But yeah. And again, it's the filter. The, yeah. We're so thankful for the no's. Because yeah. if that person was said a maybe and it was a yes, you know, it, it just wouldn't have worked. We want the enthusiastic hell yes. Yeah. No questions asked. Like the people that have said yes to us in the past, whether it was going on a first date across the world or going, uh, I mean, <laughs> there's so many. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Of it's never, they've never gone into detail of what the thing includes, whether it's safe, et cetera. They're like, that sounds amazing. I'm yeah. done. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and that's, and these people have ended up being our friends over the last five years. Amazing. Like they're people we yeah. stay in touch with for that reason. It's that spirit that we're looking for in people. Absolutely. Almost like this like childlike yeah. excitement and enthusiasm, yeah. you know, that's what we, we live for. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting is um, um, we try and make sure they don't know like that we have a YouTube channel and all these right, things because yeah. we want the the yes to be as pure as possible from a place of genuine spontaneity and excitement for adventure. Um, and so when we get that, like we've just been so lucky, like you're saying, to meet some incredible people that were open to two strangers or three strangers on the street walking around asking them for something ludicrous. Yeah. And then in the end realizing what we love is keeping, because then there's, it's all, it all just becomes more and more positive surprises, right? Like what, we're actually flying to this place and what, like, you, you know, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing thing to just watch it unfold in their eyes and reward them for the trust that they had in that moment. I'm often amazed and shocked when I talk to some of my friends who own businesses. They tell me that they're struggling to grow and expand and do not know what to do. My first response is, do you have proper visibility over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more? Most tell me no. So at that point, how can they plan to grow their business? I don't think it makes sense. Businesses that do well know all of this, and the truth is, you can too by signing up with NetSuite. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in sales, NetSuite lets you manage every penny with precision. You'll be able to compete with anyone, work from anywhere, and run your whole company right from your phone which is incredibly useful. Join over 20,000 companies who trust NetSuite to make it happen. They're the world's number one cloud business system for a reason. NetSuite surveyed hundreds of business leaders and assembled a playbook of the top strategies they're using as America reopens for business. Receive your free guide, seven actions businesses need to take now and schedule your free product tour at netsuite.com forward slash J. Get your free guide and schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com forward slash J. That's netsuite.com forward slash J. Yeah, that's awesome. One of, one of the things I've been reflecting on, which you guys are both echoing, is just mm. how everyone who's winning more is actually also losing more. Mm. Mm. So it's like anytime you're getting a yes, you've already heard like 39 no's, yeah. right? It's like every time one of those people after hours says yes, that means you've spent yeah. hours hearing no's. Yeah. And whether whatever we're doing in any of our spaces, whether it's trying to get Elon or whether it's trying to make a new video or coming up with a new concept or launching a new podcast like you guys are doing soon, like whatever it is out of all of those things, it's like you've heard no's the whole way. And I think getting used to hearing no 
is actually such an important skill. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you guys have really mastered it because I can't imagine how hard it is. You know, it's so easy for you to guys to go on the streets and be like, well, yes, theory, like, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, to, to try and, but I love the fact that you're not actually getting people to say yes because you have a YouTube channel. They're mm -hmm. saying yes because you're getting that pure yes, as you said. I mean, that's, yeah. that's awesome. I've loved that. Yeah. That's great to hear that because I think that's hard for people to understand. What's, what's been the, uh, what what have you personally learned from breaking through your fears? Like which one for you was like, mm. I really got over something, mm. right? Mm. Like I really broke through something deep, personal and intimate for me when we did this thing. That was the one where I realized I learned a lot from it. So what was the fear or mm. what was the challenge or what was the discomfort? And, and what was the lesson you learned from breaking through that individually? And it can't be together if it's like okay, no yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can go ahead. For me, the probably the the most difficult experience that I've had doing this the past five years was um, we went out with Wim Hof Iceman. Yeah, in Poland, and we ended up creating a documentary out of it because the experience was not at all what we were expecting. <laughs> like we thought we were coming out to. Um, to do the Wim Hof method and learn the basics. And as soon as we got there, he saw us all wearing our seek discomfort sweaters. And we, the first day we're like, let's go cliff jumping in the water. And he's like, okay. And you know, he's kind of seeing that we're, we're comfortable being in uncomfortable situations. And so he's like, okay, the Wim Hof method is not going to work. Like, this is going to be too easy for you guys. We got to up the stakes. <laughs> and we're like, what, what does that mean? And so the next day we wake up and he's just pacing back and forth in the breakfast room. And we're like, what, what is he? What, what's going on? And he's like, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, but he just goes, F the training. We're like, what? We're not going to do any of the training. We're going 10 minutes in ice water. Prepare. You have 30 minutes. Don't eat any breakfast. We're going in 30 minutes. Set your mind. And we're just like, what are, what are you talking about? It's like negative 10 degrees outside. Yeah, it's yeah. already, there's a snowstorm outside. Typically, if you spend more than three minutes in like below freezing ice water, which we were about to do, you can hit hypothermia if you're not careful. Like there's a lot of risks. Like there's involved. no medical staff, nothing. There, yeah. We're just like, wait, what? 10, who has done 10 minutes? Um, and, and this isn't just like a regular ice bath. This is um, like a, you know, a moving body of water. So there, it actually makes it much more challenging because when you're in an ice bath, there's like a after a few minutes, there's like a very thin coat of warm water that builds right. around your body. But here it's just, it's impossible. Like you're freezing the entire time. And I put my toes in the water and I was immediately like, I need to get out. Like within 10 seconds, I was, I thought it was over for me. Um, but we walked in all together, ended up doing this, um, like saying yes to like, okay, let's do the 10 minutes. Let's try it. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to last two minutes, two, three minutes. Um, and I'd never been in so much pain, physical pain in my whole life. And I probably, I definitely do not recommend for anyone to try this at home. But I think the, having these guys around and then having Wim there and he saw that I was the one struggling the most, um, like pushing me and encouraging me. Um, and then in the end, and I'm ending up breaking the, the 10 minute mark and then running back up to the sauna. And it took me a whole hour to like get back to normal, normal well, temperature. Yeah. Was one of the... Like I have a very like rational clock that ticks, you know, in my brain that goes, okay, it's enough. Like I, I got injured pretty hard when I was 18. I developed like these chronic injuries from, from sports. And so I've been always super careful with not pushing myself physically too much. Like if I go on a run and I start to feel my ankle weird, I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm walking back now. And this was like, within a minute, I thought it was over. And, um, so I didn't only push my, what I thought my physical ability was, but also my own perception of when I'm supposed to stop. And uh, after like calming down from that, just being so proud of myself for having achieved something that I genuinely believed was impossible 30 minutes earlier. Mm. Um, I didn't think going to Poland that I would pass two minutes in the ice water. I thought we would train our way up to two minutes. Um, so to have done 10, only using basically like the small skills that I have in meditation, just trying to like control my pain. Um, and I would love to ask you about this too, but it's just, there was something in there where I just transcended and I had to be 
so focused on just because as soon as you start shivering it's over mm -hmm. so that was the main thing he was telling us you just gotta the only thing you can use is the power of your mind and i was like what is he talking about <laughs> like the power of my mind i'm freezing yeah, like, yeah there's yeah. nothing to do with my mind but yeah. what i realized is so much uh of my own limitation that i set was in my mind yeah. it wasn't the physical pain it was how i was coping with it yeah um and how far i was allowing myself to go yeah and then the next day we climbed a mountain in a snowstorm mm -hmm. In shorts, that's it. Shorts and shoes. I uh, got to the top and that also just became one of the most surreal moments. So like back to back, I just did two things that I never thought I could do. Um, and after a few days of reflection, I just realized that now I'm like, I, I approach certain challenges with a completely new perspective. Like I don't always, previously I'd, I'd have like this okay, this is how far I can go. Yeah. You know, in my mind, I had an idea of when my limit was going to arrive. And now I'm always kind of, you know, second guessing it, not to push myself and get injured, but I'm always making sure that um, I haven't set, you know, a limit to myself that could yeah. actually just hold me back from how far I can actually go. Yeah. Um, so it was, um, it was a very interesting experience. That's awesome. Man. But in the end, just ended up gaining a new level of self-respect for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, damn, what else can I do? You know? Yeah. Um, which well, was amazing. Thank you for sharing that, man. That's what I love about this story because I think for a lot of people who are listening and watching, it's like when we see these incredible feats being performed, we often think of people who like train for them or people who are like athletes and mm. like naturally athletic yeah. and they have like, you know, like, yeah. and it's just like when, when you just look at it as normal people, like yeah. we're all of us sitting here, we're just normal people. Yeah. Who are trying to do extraordinary things with our body or our minds and giving it a go. Hmm. And when you're talking about it, I can hear it. And I, I really appreciate your honesty and vulnerability of just like, yeah, basically I thought I was gonna last 30 seconds. And and I think that's most of us in so many places. But when I hear you say it, I'm hopefully everyone who's listening and watching is gonna be like, oh yeah, if if, if Thomas can do it, like mm -hmm. I can do it too, you know? Mm. It's like and I'm not saying, again, don't try it at home, but yeah. the, point being, <laughs> the point being that you start to be like, oh, well, if he didn't train and he's not, you know, it's not like you're an athlete. It's right. not like you come from an athletic no. background. It's mm -hmm. just, this is what you could achieve by saying yes. And again, very importantly, being around a good supportive group of people, being with an expert in yeah. what he does yeah. Yeah. and being in that space. Yeah, I love that, man. That's and a good for story. for that same reason that we're so obsessed with community. Yeah. Because- had you been in that water by yourself? No, zero, literally yeah, no zero chance. percent chance. Yeah, I think yeah. for all of us. Yeah. That's, so yeah, that's what we, we just, yeah, we, everybody thrives with the supportive community. I love it, that's man. What What's yours? Mine was last year was the, I did a, my first Ironman, full Ironman triathlon. <laughs> yeah. And it was insane. It, just like Thomas said, there was just this impossibility to it. And I'd heard about it when I was 21 from a friend of my parents was this 45 year old dude and so athletic and he told me what it entailed i don't know if you know what an iron man is but it's a it's a two and a half kilometer swim a 180 kilometer bike ride and then a full marathon so it, <laughs> on average it takes then a full marathon yeah, yeah it's insane and so when he explained it that immediately it just kind of you you know you cast it aside there's just no chance but then as we started to do Yes Theory and started to meet all these incredible people, we started to meet more triathletes and Iron people who had completed Ironman, like Rich Roll. Yeah. Um, who became a big inspiration. Did you? I interviewed him last week. Oh, I no way. Him. I was with him yesterday. He, I was on his podcast yesterday. Oh, oh amazing. Yeah, 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 he's a legend. Do you guys know him? Yeah, 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 yeah he's yeah, a good yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so seeing these people, like you're saying, normal people who achieved extraordinary things, you know, you start thinking, like, maybe maybe there's something here but you don't immediately go for the full thing usually not straight into the water for 10 minutes <laughs> yeah. so i started to do a, like a small triathlon then a half by ironman and then actually on the day of the jump with will smith last year or was it two years ago two years, two years, two years, ago, years yeah two years ago i met his personal trainer aaron and i'd been thinking about doing an ironman and i walked up to him and i hadn't talked to him ever before I was like, hey, man, I heard you're Will's personal trainer. He's like, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I'm doing an Ironman in May. You should do it with me. And he kind of just looked at me like I was crazy. And I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, I'll see you later. <laughs> and then I ran into him an hour later and he'd thought about it. And he was at a point in his life where he needed something to break constructs and just get out of his shell. And he accepted. He was like, yeah, let's do it. And so within a month... I was training with Will Smith's personal trainer nearly every day. And he was giving me this curriculum of what this would actually entail. And when I'd thought about doing the Ironman, my goal was, I just want to finish. 
17 hours is the max. If I do it in 17 hours, I'll be so stoked. <laughs> I'll be the happiest man alive. And then when I started to talk to Aaron, Aaron said, when you do something in your life as big as this, you, will, you should never, ever, ever half-ass it. It should be full commitment because it's going to reflect in everything else you do after. And I never thought about it like that. I, would, I always just thought you needed to finish the thing that didn't necessarily require full effort. But he explained that the reward is in the practice. It's not in the result. And so for eight months, this man just grinded me down. <laughs> Uh, like you can, you know, to, to pebbles. I was just every day woke up at 5 a.m. feeling broken and having to go for a two hour run and then a three hour bike ride, you know. So by the end of the eight months, and this required me to take time off videos and traveling, which <laughs> sometimes is very stressful, frustrating. For these guys. Yeah. <laughs> I told him it was worth it. I was like, guys, this is going to be worth it. And then on the day of the race, uh, Aaron and I had decided that our goal was to do it in under 12 hours, which is. Uh, below it's the top quarter of the people that finished the race, wow. which having never done a, a full one, I was just like, this is ridiculous. Um, and with no sleep, cause you don't sleep the night before you're, you're so anxious and you have to wake up at three thirty AM to get to the starting line. How many people do it? 2000 did it in that race. I think 40 to 50,000 do it a year. Okay. Um, and there, it, what's amazing is it's people of all ages and you know, like there's, 21 year olds and there's 70 year olds that that go for it and wow. each have their own respective goals um but so when I, I i did it and i on what ended up happening was on I, I did the swim then i did the bike and then on mile 10 of the race which was about 10 hours in my body just completely shut down and i started to cry and started to walk and after eight months of training i was so mad at my body i was like how could you do this to me and then as I was walking and other people around you are collapsing as well. So you're like, I guess I can just give up here. You know, I, you know, what is it? 16 more miles to go. There's just no freaking chance. And then I actually thought about Amar who had done a marathon without training the year before. And he told me that halfway through the race, the same thing happened. And that he decided that Every mile from that point on, he would dedicate to somebody that he loved and he would imagine them running by his side. Wow. And so remembering that and remembering Aaron, everything Aaron had taught me, I slowly started to get back up and slowly started to run. And every single mile was, I, first I imagined my brother, then I imagined Thomas, I imagined my parents, I imagined my friend Steve, I imagined all these people who especially supported me the last eight months. And like, I'm crying and I'm running and I'm just <laughs> full of sweat and people are just dying next to me, you know, like giving up. And I'm, I just have these people in my mind and I refuse to think of anything else. And what's wild is if you look at the time, I actually speed up the second half of the race faster than I was the first half. So these guys were tracking me. And when I was hitting that mile, they were like, oh God, he's stopping. And then they were like, oh, wait, what's, you know, he's picking it back up. And it was because of that community. And so on the last mile, and by that point, I'm just completely ruined, <laughs> you know, <laughs> these guys came for the last mile and ran it with me by my side. And by the end, there's just nothing left. And the video at the end is just me collapsing in Amar's arms and then these guys' arms. And it was just, a, and I finished in 11 hours and 57 minutes. So three minutes below the 12 hour mark that I aimed for. And it was the first time in my life that I felt like a winner. For so long, forever, there's I was just riddled with self doubt. I was like, I'm not a winner, and I have to even through yesterday, I was like, you know, th like it was motivated by self doubt to prove to myself. But this was it was me. Like I had to prove this. This was just me, and yes, with the support of the community, but it's all in my mind. And to be able to hit your goal under 12 hours and see it visually, you know, and physically, hmm. has I mean, completely profoundly changed my life. After we went to dinner, I went to dinner with Aaron and I hadn't really thought about the whole thing. I was just happy it was over. And he walks up to me and by this point, he's like my best friend and my partner, you know, he's just my guy. And he just pats me on the shoulder and he's like, hey, buddy, just so you know, those three minutes are going to change the rest of your life. <laughs> and I just, you know, stood in silence. I was like, wow. And it's been uh, eight months since that day and so many parts of my life have changed because of it 
so many things I thought were impossible have changed, whether it was with relationships or goals that I had or even something like approaching a backflip that I never, you know, there's just small things and big things because I, I finally was able to prove to myself that I could win. You know, when you, it just changes your identity to go through that discomfort and to come out successful. Mm. It's the most blissful, beautiful, freeing experience that a human can possibly have. So to chase that discomfort is, that's why we preach it because it, that's what creates freedom, you know? And even for somebody like you, I'm sure writing a book has been a thing that you've wanted to do forever, for example, and so many other things, but to actually have it in your hands, be like, I, I made this thing <laughs> and it's probably going to be number one in your times bestseller, maybe, <laughs> you know, like you did this and these are physical manifestations of what we're capable of. Yeah. And the, and the reason something like a yes theory or seek discomfort never gets old is because the challenge just continues. You know, you, what, like, what else can I do is the question. And, you know, there's opportunity everywhere. It's endless. And that's what makes life so goddamn exciting. <laughs> it's like a playground for all your dreams, one after the other, if you tackle them. Yeah. It's the most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, that's like our fuel, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story, man. That's Thank beautiful you. hearing it from your Thank from your mouth in that way. It's like it's yeah, it's like I was there with you, you know. I felt, yeah. When I was hearing you say that, I really felt like I was there with you. And I, I love that the fears are different. What you find easy or hard is different. Like, mm -hmm. you know, as humanity, like we we all find certain things really easy and simple and natural and effortless. And there are certain things that we find hard and it's different for different people. Yeah. And we don't have the same challenges and we don't feel the same discomfort. Like for some people 100%. sitting in cold is easy and for some yeah. people sitting in heat is hard. And for some, you know, whatever it is, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's different. And I, I think it's wonderful that you all like let yourselves you gave him eight months off <laughs> from making <laughs> videos <laughs> to, go and, to go and test yeah. this. And, yeah. uh, and you know, you had, you had a different test. And this may be because when I hear you guys talk about this, there's camaraderie, there's friendship, there's brotherhood, like there's respect. Like when I hear you all sharing the stories today and when I watch your content, it's not like a dare, mm -hmm. right? There's a difference and it's, it's subtle, but it's, it's something that I really want to bring up is that I don't feel like you guys are daring each other. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're like cheering each other on. You're like, you're like wanting the person to win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the difference between a real discomfort challenge versus peer pressure. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like there's a difference and I feel like you've built a community around really challenging yourselves and rooting for your friends and brothers to win and sisters to win and you're, you're really rooting for each other. Whereas I feel that in the same way, we often experience dare culture or, or like peer pressure culture, like force culture. Mm -hmm. and, and I know for me that force culture is always made me back away from challenges. Totally. Whereas the brotherhood has always made me want to challenge myself more. So tell me about how you've been able to understand the difference and mm. how you've been able to focus so strongly on the positive one. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. I think the, the intention behind it is the most important thing. Like, why are you, you know, doing, challenging this person to, to do it? Because if it comes from a place of like, okay, I'm going to humiliate this person or I'm going to, you know, put them in a position that's going to make them feel really bad about themselves, like that's terrible. You know what I mean? Like, and, or if you're doing it only because you think this might get views or, you know, if you're doing a, going down a cart and, you know, in a staircase, just because you think it's whatever, it's, um, that never sits well. Whereas if you're like, okay, I'm going to give my friend five minutes to prepare for a stand-up set and sign him up without him knowing, that's a whole different thing because it's coming from a place of, yes, you know, you, there's an element of cheekiness, but there's definitely, it's also like a belief that doing this is something that has an element of growth, like being up and bombing and then coming back down is an experience that is in the moment painful and not great. But in the end, you've now experienced what it is to not do great. And then from there, like literally anything else <laughs> on stage is not going to feel as bad as whatever that was. You know, there is always something to learn there. And yeah. with everything we do, if we ever put each other in, in uncomfortable or difficult situations, it always comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of, I think, you know, this person is actually going to benefit from this experience. Mm -hmm. There, There's, um, would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the intention. So was it loving when you sent me to Miami to 
take the world's longest bus ride? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that love? <laughs> so I, I booked a ticket for him and his brother. Yeah. yeah. And, and then two of our British friends to take the longest bus ride in America. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. On a Greyhound. On a Greyhound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't love. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> it didn't feel like love. Yeah. <laughs> but it turned out to be an amazing bonding experience for yeah. you and, yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. those three guys. And then you also got to see the country that you're from yeah. in, in a completely new lens, right? I remember <laughs> yeah. your brother came back and he was like, that was actually really That's cool. cool. Um, which is, there's always an, an unexpected thing that happens, yeah. a, a magic that, that kind of comes to play when you put yourself in that kind of situation. And um, yeah, I mean, we sent Amar to... Uh, Czechoslovakia with blindfolds on when we were in Europe and he had to figure out his way back with zero dollars. He didn't know what country he was in. He didn't know what country he was in. Slovakia, I think it was. How did oh, he Slovakia. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he, <laughs> so first thing, he walked up to people and asked like, what country am I in? And people were so confused. They were like, what? What do you mean? What country are you in? How did you get here? And he's got a blindfold on. No, so he had to, he was able to oh, take it off. Oh, he's allowed to take it off. Okay. Yeah, he took it off. Um, that we took him there blindfolded, so he didn't know where he was. Sure. And then uh, eventually, just ended up meeting a few younger people that thought what he just was doing was hilarious. And then they actually ended up hanging out with them on their farm and got like a haircut. And then eventually got like a couple of euros to take a bus to the border and then another mm -hmm. bus. And he kind of just like figured his way back. Um, Who paid for his flight? No, so it was, so we were in a neighboring country. We okay. were, so, so yeah, he had to, there was a few connecting, three or four connecting buses that Got he could it. take, it, but he also didn't know how, like how that would work. So first he had to like, cause he didn't have his phone either. He didn't have internet. So, but when, in the end, like he ended up meeting these locals in Slovakia, like he never would have experienced that otherwise yeah. in his life. Um, and, and there's just, you know, when you're put in those situations, he also knows that we're we're coming from a place of love, right? We're not trying to humiliate him or make him look bad. Um, we're trying to put him in a, in a situation where he just gets an extremely authentic travel experience yeah. <laughs> and, and like a survival challenge to be yeah. like, now I know that if I'm in a country where I don't speak the language, I don't even know where I am, yeah. I can get back to where I came from, yeah. which is also a very humbling experience to have. So yeah. that's yeah. always where, what it is. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of love, I can tell. Yeah, because we don't yeah. ever want any of us to no. be in serious harm, right? Like when they were, when we were in that ice water yeah. or, you know, when, when Matt is running the Ironman, like we're in 100% support of yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. And we never want to, it's never like, you know, push yourself mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a way that could harm you. Like we're always very cautious of making sure we balance that line of, okay, when is too far? And it, it's almost become an instinctual thing now where we just know and we can feel, okay, yeah, just, just you know, let's just stop. Let's yeah. just not do it. Yeah. Um, and it is a fine line to know yeah. where, the, where the limit is. Um, yeah. But I think now we're good friends and we, we've spent enough time with each other and also with other people in moments of discomfort and of fear to know when it's time to like, yeah. okay, it's probably, you've probably gone yeah. enough. No, it's nice yeah. to hear it. And I, and I think it's an important message because I think it's, you know, I think from an immature standpoint, everyone can get very carried away with their culture, but yeah. the way I wanted to hear you guys talk totally. about it because it's never come across that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why there, there are times when I'd, I would shy away from a challenge when I feel it's coming from a yeah. competitive comparison place, mm -hmm. as opposed to when I feel it's coming from a compassionate, loving, mm -hmm. let's, let's kind of do this mm -hmm. space, you know, and it's, it's it's really interesting to just see how things have changed. You you guys remind me of so many things. When you talk about this bus journey, I did this. I talk about it in my book, Think Like a Monk. I, I talk about, uh, I took a, it was between 48, I can't even remember how long it was, but it was mm. definitely between 48 to 72 hour train journey in India. Wow. So it's from like Mumbai to South India. So it's a long journey all the way across mm -hmm. basically a lot of India. And we because we were monks, we traveled like third class, like meaning like you're traveling on the cheapest economy level ticket on a train. Hmm. And the trains in India, like there are people who pay for tickets and then there are people who just jump on and hmm. ride as long as they can. So you've got like us sitting on seats, but you're now sitting next to three other people who have not paid for that seat. And there are all <laughs> these people on the floors and like it's crowded, like it's packed. Wow. Like there's no space and you're trying to breathe. And then you go to the, the toilet which is literally just like, I mean, you can imagine it already. So I remember like not eating for two days because I just didn't wow. want to use the restroom. Like that was the reason. Like, wow. No other reason. It's just like crap. But it's like, 
having done that and, mm. and having pushed it, and it's funny because we were with one of the senior monks and I was telling him, I was like, I'm not sure I can meditate here either. Like maybe I'll wait till, you know, mm. we get off of the other side and I'll catch up on my meditation. And he goes, and, he, and I remember him saying to me, he goes, he goes, do you think the time of death is gonna be peaceful? And I was like, no. And he goes, well, then you should meditate right now if you wanna meditate at the time of death. But I was like, what? He, he was just like, you can't wait for peace to meditate. Mm. Like you should, if you can meditate in this, then you'll be able to meditate anywhere. Wow. And it was just, you know, it was like a really forceful lesson of like, oh yeah, that's, that's what meditation's for, mm. right? Like not waiting for peace, but totally. to find peace within chaos. And so, yeah, we, I, anyway, we'll have to do a separate one where, where I get to share some. Is there, is, did you have an, what was the most challenging experience you had when you were a monk? Was there a moment where you like really pushed past your limit, but you didn't yeah. think you were going to be able to do yeah, it? Yeah, loads. I mean, there's, there's stuff like, you know, when you're meditating for eight hours at a time, that's really hard because, and, it, and it's almost more, it starts off physically hard because it's sitting in the same place, right? For eight hours. It's dealing with the fact that there might be a mosquito biting you there might be it might be really hot outside right mm. the sun in india is really hot the uh the, the the times are changing around you've got ants everywhere you know you've got all these things going on so it starts of being like a physical pain mm. and then it's almost like when you finally when you realize like you said with the cold in the same way you can't as soon as you start shivering or as soon as i start itching and scratching myself like meditation's over mm -hmm. and now you're just lost in the physical but as soon as you go inward you're now dealing with all the noise up here mm. yeah so now it's all like the self-doubt now it's like the, the the constant conversation the noise of opinions the noise of all the ego coming up humiliation all the questioning so you're now lost in this mental space yeah and like all the kind of like every piece of self-doubt every question you've ever been asked all the like all the mistakes you've made, or everything just everything just comes to the fore, and now you're dealing with that. Yeah, and then you have to go beyond that to finally reach a space of quiet. So mm. it's much more of a subtle internal battle as opposed to an external mm. pain, which I think all of it is. Like even hearing you say that, like it's funny. Our teachers used to say uh, that whenever you get stuck in meditation, you should meditate and pray for those who are in need. So you would think of someone who needs that extra hour of your meditation mm. and you would dedicate that extra hour or half an hour of your meditation to that person mm. because that compassion would pull you through. Even if you weren't doing it for yourself, when you felt you wow. were doing it for someone else, you could break through. So hearing you say that was, yeah. was super powerful. Like, so, so for me, it was more, yeah, it was more like having to break through that noise and, and really being able to silence and quiet the mind. Fasting was really tough. Like, I don't know if you guys have tried any fasts, but when we would do like no food and no water for three days in a row. No like, water either. Yeah, no water either. Like that wow. kind of stuff was really tough. While having to meditate. Yeah, and you can't sleep, like you can sleep normal hours that you sleep, but you can't sleep during the day right. to avoid being awake. And so stuff like that was, wow. that's when, when I started to fast, cause I was like, you can't live without food. Like, you know, that feeling or water. When you push through that for the first 24 hours that you do it, you're like, yeah oh wow, like, you know, yeah. my body can actually live off of a lot less than, than I believe. So things like that, being in extreme heat and extreme cold, it, it was never the cold baths, but it was like whether we were at the foothills of the Himalayas, mm. and we would bathe in the Ganga or the Ganges as it's known. And, and up there it's freezing, like, you know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's not nearly at the source of where it comes from. So yeah, those kind of experiences, similar to yours, but not in the same, you know, for us it was all, it was, spiritually motivated from the point of view of there was some spiritual purification it was all yeah. about cleansing and purifying the mind and and breaking the the breaking the doubts that we have in the mind mm. so similar to, to the way you guys yeah. are saying it but do you ever this is kind of a weird question yeah. but do you ever miss that focus like do you ever because now you're doing so much you have yeah. all these things happening you live in a in los angeles which is probably the noisiest city in the entire world yeah for all these things happening do you, it, it's the polar opposite of what you were doing before. Do you ever miss the, that kind of environment? So I feel like I'm applying the same mindset that I applied there mm -hmm. to what I'm doing now. And that's why I feel like I'm still thinking like a monk. And I feel like you guys are yeah. too, because all I'm doing is then the noise is different. The challenge is different, but the mindset needed is the same, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's like taking that same mindset of how do we not get distracted in the noise? How do you not get carried away? How do you mm. not get lost in what's happening here? So I feel like I'm using that toolkit and I have to constantly sharpen that toolkit and get better at sure. it. 
But I, I kind of love being challenged the same way as we used to. Like it's a different challenge. It's a new challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now the challenge is far more mental and subtle and almost uh, less gross and physical. Mm -hmm. But but it's it's still there. And and I enjoy that. I think I'm I think I thrive off of that as well. It's just that the challenge is not as tangible anymore. Mm, for like sure. it's not necessarily breakthroughing a number of days or a number of minutes, but it's it's like breaking through like your ego, which yeah. is which is really hard yeah. and, and painful yeah. to look at. Yeah. It's a tough one. So it's that kind <laughs> yeah. of, yeah, it's that kind of challenge. So yeah. no, I, I feel, oh, sorry, man. I, yeah. I just feel like, uh, yeah, I feel like it's a different challenge. Yeah. Uh, do I miss, I, I, I go back and stay with the monks again every year. So I still do that mm -hmm. every December and January, me and my wife go back and we spend two to three weeks meditating again for long amounts of time and nice. with the monks and everything. So I kind of re get to relive it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I feel like the challenges I have now make me more grateful for those experiences. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Been, you have more yeah. experience with that stuff than all of Los Angeles, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. And so do you with everything you've done. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I could talk to you guys for hours. I know you guys have got to leave soon. So I want to, I feel like we need to do a part two as well. Yeah, that would be great. This has been amazing. Oh, yeah. Like I have learned so much from you guys. <laughs> I already respected you guys like, up here and now my respect for you guys is just on the roof like i already was in love with you guys and now i'm like more in love with you guys and it's like you, you're special man like i love what you guys are doing like and, and i love you. how genuine sincere and 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 deep you guys are about it like i think that's what i love about it the most that that your intention is so good and oh, and man, that's why you. so many people are in love with you guys we picked out this uh, fan comment and, and appreciation. I'm sure you get tons of these, but we picked this out because I wanted to share it with you. So mm. these guys were one of the main reasons I overcame depression and anxiety a few months ago. I suppose my story relates most to what Thomas was saying at the end, that yes, theory is not about quitting your job or dropping everything, but just about making time to do things that take you out of your comfort zone. Mm. I mean, how does it feel when you hear people breaking through like depression and anxiety? And mm. I'm sure you've had you know, all sorts of feedback. Like, how does that feel when you hear that? Relatable, because we struggle with both of those things a lot. Um, and the reason we're so obsessed with the message is because it's, it's been a path for us as well. So I see myself in a message like that completely, you know. I mean, when we first met, we were anxious messes trying to figure out life. And we still struggle with anxiety. You know, and obviously meditation helps, being around people like you helps, and discomfort helps. Um, and that's why the person like that not only benefits from, uh, I guess, you know, the content and watching us, but from the community that they create around themselves. Mm -hmm. And the only reason we've been able to do what we do and grow as people is because of, you know, our community. So it's every single time it's just like, damn, that's me too. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know, we're mm -hmm. in this together, baby. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's an amazing byproduct uh, of what it is that we're creating. And we're so grateful that we're making videos that can touch people in that way. Because as Matt said, like anxiety has been something we've struggled with and, and Amar struggled with depression. So to be able to give people something that gets them out of that headspace or, or at least makes them realize that it's possible um, is the most rewarding part of everything that we do. And do you feel that your service is also your antidote to that depression and anxiety? Absolutely. Like, do you feel like what you're doing is what helps you get through it? Or what are you guys using to, apart from meditation or being around the right people, what else are you guys doing to, to get through that yourself? I think other than the classic, you know, exercise, therapy, all that, which is all important stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Much needed. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if people don't have a, a great morning routine based mm -hmm. around, you know, for us, it's, it is, Matt got me into meditation and exercise and then, you know, weekly therapy and then just journaling as well. All of these basic things seem quite simple and people, you hear them everywhere, but there's a reason why everyone says they're beneficial, yeah. right? It's because they had actually does make a difference. Mm -hmm. So for me, like giving myself time in the morning to do it too. So I'm not just rushing it to be like, okay, I'm going to meditate five minutes and then exercise 20 minutes, but rather like being intentional with it mm -hmm. has made a big difference. I think the honestly challenging who you think you are, mm. like finding ways to challenge these constructs that you've built in your head. Like I am a depressed person. I am an anxious person. No, you're not, but you're doing all these things that reinforce that story. 
So how do you shift that story? And honestly, doing extreme challenges for yourself starts to, you start to question all these things you've told yourself your whole life. Mm. That's why it's so important to do something in mm. like that really you think And this is, is coming really from impossible. someone who is anxious. Yeah. yeah. And who's said, I am anxious all the time. Yeah. I'm an anxious person. I used to say, tell myself that I'm an anxious person. And it's like, no, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up. Yeah. <laughs> But then that's the first step of being like, there is a version of me that can experience less anxiety and also accept the fact that anxiety is a part of the the scope of emotions that, mm -hmm. that, that everybody in the world experiences. And if, you know, with intention, create the right habits to, um, to limit that, then you can actually end up on the other side, yeah. feeling much more fulfilled and calm and grateful every single day. Yeah. So, nice. yeah. Amazing, man. You guys are brilliant. I can dive <laughs> into so much more. We definitely have to do a part two, but we yes. end every podcast with two segments, fill in the blanks mm. and the fast five. So we're going to start with fill in the blanks. So each of you get a chance to just fill in the the sentence so amazing content creators are i'd say winging it <laughs> winging it yeah like everybody else i guess so okay yeah. nice good answer all right the internet is either of you can go messy and beautiful was what i thought at beautiful the same disaster time. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay uh seeking discomfort doesn't mean recklessness i would agree with that okay Yes theory at its core helps people become free and connected. Nice. What impresses me most about humans is their ability to overcome challenges, redefine themselves. Awesome. I always say no to first one I thought it was pointless parties. <laughs> no. That's a great one. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely no to pointless parties and no to anyone who doesn't make you feel free. Nice. Change your life by saying yes to small things like? Cold showers. Hmm. We did a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> and journaling. That's the new oh, one yeah. for me. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Journaling's huge, yeah. man. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. You can choose love over fear by? Being kind when it isn't convenient. Hmm. Realizing that it's a choice. Nice. Amazing. That was good, guys. Fill in mm. the blanks. Okay, these are your fast five. So oh. these are fast five, rapid fire, quick fire answers. Okay. Okay, the last kind thing you've done for a stranger. I'm guessing you guys do loads. I um, there was a homeless guy um, sitting on the side of the street and I wasn't going to stop. I biked past him and then he his cart fell on the side of the road. And I was just like, oh, I... And, and my instinct was, I, I, I'm too busy. I got to go do my thing. And then I turned around and I asked him if he needed help. And he was like, yes, please. Yeah. Like immediately he was like, thank you. He couldn't lift it himself. Yeah. Um, so I just helped him get up. And then I saw he was walking to Subway. So I just offered to buy him the, the dinner. Awesome. And he was, um, he was just super grateful. And I came seconds away from just talking my way out of it. But yeah. very glad that I did. Awesome, bro. Matt? No. We our most recent thing that we did as a group was renovating in a lady's house who wow. um her backyard, yeah. That we met because someone said that she was the kindest person that they'd met. Oh. So that felt really good. Is that video out yet? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. nice. Okay. I need to yeah. check that out. Okay, we'll yeah. we'll get everyone to watch that. What have you been chasing in your life that you no longer pursue? What's been something that you've been like chasing that you now realize you're not chasing anymore? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, your face. Yeah. <laughs> At least something that I'm trying to pursue less is um, too much um, weight on approval of others, mm. but trying to always check myself. Am I doing this for for myself in a, in a place of growth or am I doing it because I want somebody else to think that I'm something that I'm not? Yeah. I'm trying to pursue less of catastrophizing. I'm trying to, it's not the end of the world if <laughs> <laughs> certain things don't go right sometimes yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah for sure yeah. yeah all right cool as an anxious man i can relate <laughs> <laughs> the third one the one video you'd love my audience to watch and why one of your videos oh. that you'd love my audience to go check out after listening to this interview mm. i think the two that we mentioned iron man and the Wim half documentary yeah, yeah those are great yeah okay. we're very proud yeah. of those great all right guys make yeah. sure you go check those out i say question number four if you could create a law for everyone in the world to follow, what would it be? That's an amazing question. Mm. 
I got it from my similar from my good friend uh, Drama. Mm. No drama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So he asked me a similar question. So That's we adapted it. <laughs> I, I would say like doing a random act of kindness on a weekly basis, like mm -hmm. getting out of your way to help a complete stranger or maybe someone in your family or friend um, without them needing to ask you for help, just offering it um, or, or trying to, you know, get one step ahead and, and seeing that you can offer, offer a hand. Nice. Yeah. That's a good one. To tell someone something you're afraid of. Interesting. Mm -hmm. wow. Genuinely afraid of. Yeah. yeah. That's a unique one for sure. <laughs> nice. All right. Fifth and final question. What was your biggest lesson personally from the last 12 months? The mm. biggest lesson you've learned in the last 12 months? For me, it's perspective. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about it a lot the past few, especially the past few weeks. Just I can, I'm in control of how I see a situation mm. and I can be extremely upset or, you know, feel defeated from a failure or I can decide to see it as, as a learning lesson. Uh, something that I love recently is life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard that quote before. Mm -hmm. um, good one. And just having that perspective um, and always reminding myself uh, of that has been a, such a life-changing mm -hmm. uh, lesson. I think the lesson for me is, and I think you both, because you're, you've are you been in longer relationships than I have, especially you, Jay. Uh, but the advice somebody recently gave me is when you're, especially starting to see someone that you're interested in, that it's never supposed to be feel hard, that it should actually feel, whether it's a friend or uh, somebody you're dating, it, it should feel very easy yeah, uh, and very open. Um, and I think I've always had this common misconception that it's supposed to be this difficult romantic struggle or whatever. Um, but I think, yeah, now I'm, I don't know, I've kind of, Realized after struggling with many different kinds of relationships that the best ones are actually the easiest where you feel the most comfortable with the person. Yeah, so. yeah. I love it, guys. That's yes, theory, everyone. You guys are amazing. <laughs> man, Tom, thank you. Cheers, for, dude. Thank, thank you. you for doing this, man. Appreciate you guys it. are just, yeah, you guys are brilliant. And I hope that today has allowed people to see the the depths of your minds and just how how much you're both dedicated to this process. Like you mm -hmm. guys are really living it, you know, and that's that's the best part about it. You guys are genuinely testing yourselves. You can see how much growth and learning's happening mm -hmm. in those minds and, and, and through the lives that you're living. And yeah, I'm so excited for you to, I'm so excited for, uh, to be friends for decades. Absolutely. Because I feel like, you know, we're all so lucky that we're meeting each other now. Yeah. And I feel like one day we're going to look back when we're like <laughs> 70 years old, <laughs> yeah, just eight years old, and we're going to look back at like all the <laughs> stuff we used to say and all the stuff we used to do and... And it's going to be fun to be able to live that life together, you know. Like yeah. it's going to be exciting. We're so I'm so grateful to to know you guys right now, and yeah, yeah I'm just so excited to see what you mm -hmm. do. I'm excited for your podcast. Yeah, that's about to launch. Tell us a oh, bit dude. about that, and tell us a bit about why should people should listen to it, and and where people can find it, and uh, absolutely why you started one. I'm excited. So to it's finally out. an opportunity for us to go deeper, and and you know, in the videos, you can't always really understand how something, how an experience. Um, became powerful and how what we actually learned from it. And so it's an opportunity for us to bring in some of the most just, I, I guess it's an opportunity for us to bring in some of the most exciting people that we've met along the way that have truly changed our lives um, and dive deep into what we've learned and how you can apply it into your own life. Um, so obviously your podcast is very targeted, is very oriented towards a self-improvement. Um, and at the core of our message, uh, th that's what you know, we definitely align on that. Yeah. And so what we want to do is just give people opportunity to really dive deep um, into the topic of discomfort um, and into self-improvement to then just be able to grow uh, and, and as a community and, and as individuals. Amazing. What's the podcast called? It's called the Yes Theory Podcast. Easy. Super nice. Simple. Is there anything yeah, you want to say about the when? podcast? It's launching. We don't have the, do we have the exact date? So it's launching early April. Okay. So by so, the time this is out, people will know that it will already Amazing. be out. So if you're listening to this, exactly. it's already out. Yeah. Go and find it. It's an opportunity uh, to dive deep into good. discomfort and, and hopefully get some incredibly insightful conversations. Amazing, man. Yeah, go follow these guys across Instagram. Follow them on YouTube. Of course, subscribe if you haven't already. Go check out the podcast. Uh, highly recommend everything they put out. Thank you, and yeah, you, just so, so grateful to have you guys on. Thank I'm you so, so excited, much, man. So Appreciate it. Read your book. Yeah, I'm excited to get it to you guys. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Congratulations on Thank that. Much, man. This is awesome. awesome. Of course. Thanks everyone Thank for you. listening. 
Uh, make sure you share on Instagram the biggest takeaways from Matt and Thomas and Amar and Spirit. Uh, tag us all in on Instagram to let us know what you gained, what you learned, which was the wisdom nuggets that stood out to you. And I can't wait to see them. Make sure to tag all of us so that we can reciprocate and engage with you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Hey everyone, my name is Jay Shetty and welcome to my YouTube channel. Every week I'm sharing three videos that are going to help you feel more fulfilled, feel more happy and more successful. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you can find out about the videos as soon as they launch. Press the like button and leave a comment and let's keep making wisdom go viral together. Make sure you subscribe.